So our topic today then is using BBA to update, to modify databases. And of course, this is gonna be uh, the lecture that really gets us prepared for the next project, for the database modification project. And I'm hoping to get you steered right in the right direction. Now, remember, in case you're watching the video, you go back to watch the video and think, oh, here's where we start. No, 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 because I really got you started on this project on the lecture where we talked about uh, using the built-in dialogues, um, like to be able to kind of open uh, those dialog boxes and choose files and, and so forth. So I gave you a structure on that that will really get you started to process the files, because what you have to do in this project is you've got to take 48 files uh, that have information about um, you know, crimes committed on university campuses, and you have to read the data in for the year, was it 2010 or 2011? Or so, I think it's 2011. Anyway, this was really the way that the FBI distributed this data, like in a bunch of Excel files, not ever intended for, for Excel to read or computer read, but intended for, intended for humans to look at, which always has struck me as amazing. Did I tell you the story about when I got this data? I got this data, I think, in 2011, so 10 years ago. And... Um, the FBA, to this day, they maintain a site. What does it call it? It's known as the Crimes Known to Law Enforcement data set, but I can't remember exactly what the website is called. But if you, if you Google FBI Crimes Known to Law Enforcement, you'll get to the data set immediately. Well, uh, back in you know, 2011, they're like, hey, listen, if you, want the, if you want the data for this, send an email to this, you know, this person at FBI.gov. And I thought, oh, I'd really like to get the data. This is an interesting data set. So I sent off the email and about three weeks later, a CD-ROM arrived with all this data on it. I thought, oh, great, this is the data. And I kind of popped it in and said, yeah, that's the data I was looking for. Fantastic. I'm going to make a great example with this. And that's the foundation of the data that's used for this example. About a month later, really before I even really worked with the data, I got a call in my office. And our office phones, they have a little caller ID. And it said Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now, listen, I live a really boring life. And yet, when the FBI called me, I thought, my goodness, what have I done? And I answered the phone very hesitantly. Uh, and they said, uh, you know, I said, this is Professor Allen. Oh, Professor Allen, did you receive a CD from us uh, with some data on it, like crime statistics? And I said, yes. And I opened my top drawer. I could see it right there. I said, I have it right here. And they said, good. Do you think you could send that back to us? That was our original. <laughs> that was our master copy. And I was all, I would be more than happy to send that right back to you. Don't ever call me again. And uh, you know, that's your, that's your Federal Bureau of Investigation at work. You know, they sent off their master copy to me. I must have had an intern working or something. I'm not quite sure. Okay, so, um, so let's go ahead and download this. Um, oh, yeah, so that's the, that's the data for the assignment. We're not actually using that data today but uh, the, what the project is going to do is going to say you've got a bunch of Excel files to read, and you've got to write the data into an access database. And so, um, we're, so we're going to kind of do an example of doing that today in class. It'll be a different database. So you want to go ahead and download this, um, this work log access database. It looks like I already downloaded it. Um, and then open up this connection. We're going to need to copy this code in. So you follow that link and it will give you some code to copy into a blank workbook. But I do wanna make it clear that there's no magic here other than what we're bringing in. So instead of downloading a workbook with this code in, I wanna say you're starting with a blank workbook so you know exactly what changes are being made. And then we're gonna copy that code in. Okay, so in fact, let's go ahead and do that. So I've got this code up. I'm just gonna copy that into a new module of a blank workbook. So we're okay, you know, edit, I'm sorry, uh, file, uh, I'd rather insert, I don't even know how to enter a module, <laughs> insert module. And I think I already have option explicit, you can't have that twice, so I'm just gonna paste in all of that code. And then once we've got that code pasted in, we're gonna save the workbook. And we wanna save the workbook in the same location where you downloaded the access database. Um, because this code here is going to, um, it's gonna it's try to figure out where the database is by looking at what the path of the workbook is. So it's gonna start with the path of the workbook and assume that's where the database is. I'm gonna go ahead and get that saved. I just did this in my downloads folder, so you can do that same thing. 
or wherever you, wherever you download it. Make sure you save it as an XLSM. And this will be right to DB all 21. Okay, so I think we've got uh, the Excel workbook uh, set up. A any questions or is there anyone saying, hey, I'm, I'm not quite there, not, ready, not quite ready to go along. I'm getting close. Okay, so we're ready, we're ready to move forward. Okay, so remember that these, these objects, the connection objects and the record set object, they're not built into Excel. They're not loaded by default. Uh, so we have to tell VBA that we're gonna use them. And we do that, put the little comment up here, go to tools, references, and the micro, Microsoft ActiveX data access library. So I'm gonna do that right now. Tools, references, and then I'll scroll down to where I find Microsoft ActiveX data objects library. And there are lots of different versions, 2.0 up through 2.8. I'm gonna to go to 6.1, which is the most recent one for me. The thing is I make sure I put the checkbox, not just click the line, but I gotta click the checkbox. Uh, yes, is that larger enough? Do we need to go back and kind of see the choices as well? So you choose tools and then references, and then we're looking for this one. Is that big enough? I can go bigger. Ooh. Is that one? A little more? Okay, anyone else? Um, we're getting the, and, and again, that's just, it's just because there are so many different objects that we could use that, uh, that even the, the kind of the, the namespace in which VBA is trying to work, it's like it, it doesn't even want to know that those are all out there. Unless you're saying, you know what, this one, the really unusual, I'm gonna go ahead and bring this one in and, and use it. It's just to kind of make the rest of what we do in VBA a little more efficient. Even though it's a little more inconvenient when we wanna do these objects. Okay, so we're gonna pause here for a second. We're gonna go back to the blog. And hopefully this link will work for you. I had some trouble with it um, here, but if you go to the online query link, I'll kind of talk you through what we're about to do. Uh, online query. And this should take you to a page that's kind of already configured and has credentials put in so that you can execute and ask for some data. So just click the submit button and that will say that's the query you want to run and it, that the SQL statement that you want to run and it will bring this back. So here's the context for the example that we're gonna work in class today. You're gonna to suppose that you're you know, working for the HR department, you know, for some company that you know, kind of, when we hire people, we wanna know how good they are with Excel. Um, and have you had this kind of a project where you, 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 uh, uh, you applied for a job and they said, great, you, know, you made it past the first level. Um, here's, a, here's like a data project that we want you to do. So take this Excel workbook and do something with it. How many of you had a, actually had that experience? So it looks like you know maybe one out of one, one out of five or six here in the class uh, has done that. It's a pretty common thing. Um, say to say rather than just tell us how good you are with Excel or show us on your resume that you know Excel, actually giving you something to do with Excel. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to say, all right, suppose that that's what we're doing. We're giving um, you know potential applicants a task in Excel, but we don't just want to see what they come up with. We want to see how they did it. We want to see step by step what they did to accomplish this workbook. Uh, and so we're going to kind of, kind of wire up Excel to be able to do that. To, to record every time they make a change to a single cell in a workbook, we want to log that. Now, one way that we could log it is we could like have a hidden work, we could have a hidden worksheet in the workbook. And we could just write those changes out to the workbook. But the problem with that is, is they might take the file that we gave them, kind of you know, work on it, kind of practice it, and then decide, you know what, I'm gonna throw that out and start again. And we would like to know everything that they did kind of to get here. And so instead of just logging it locally, every time they make a change to a cell, we're gonna, uh, ever since COVID, I can't snap anymore. I'm not sure why. It's an unknown side effect. 
oh yeah, you're showing off now. Okay. So, but every time they make a change to a, to a cell, we want to write this to a log in the cloud. We want to be able to say, yeah, you wrote that so that, that even if they don't ever turn in that workbook that they started on, that we'll still know kind of all the process. We want to see the missteps that they made. How long did it take them to kind of work through it? So we're looking for some deep analysis here. And so that's what this is, what we're seeing right here. That, uh, how many records do we have? Not very many. Um, but the idea here is at a particular time, we want to know what the username is. We want to know what the, uh, what the workbook they're working on is, what sheet they're changing, what cell they're changing, the formula that they're putting into that cell, and the value that is going into that cell. That's, that's what I would like to be able to record. And so this is, this is it, right? From VBA, we're going to be pushing data into a database. Right? So that's what we're after. Ah, all right. So, uh, by the way, there's another table here. Select star from besides work log, there's one called applicant. And I should be able to submit applicant. Yeah, so here's just a list of the applicants that we're pulling off of this database. Now, this database is in the cloud. So this is Microsoft SQL Server uh, that we're using. It's the same database that we worked with when we were pulling data out um, last time, or it's a similar one. I think it's the same one. <sighs> okay. So I'm gonna come back and just as review, we're gonna look over this procedure called import applicants. So there's nothing new here. This is the same stuff that we did last week. It's a different table, um, probably a little bit different connection. Uh, I've done the connection here. Just to kind of simplify the code, I've actually put the username and the password that we'll be using here inside the connection string um, so that we don't have to supply it when we open the connection. And that'll just make the code a little bit easier to switch back and forth between the SQL Server example and the Microsoft Access example, which is what we're about to do. So what this does is it says, it just says select you know, all records, all columns, all records from the applicant table. It's going to make a new worksheet and it's going to put the headers onto that worksheet and then copy the data into the worksheet. This is the same thing that we did last time. Hopefully, if I run that, it'll run without error and it will bring in the applicant data onto a new sheet here in my workbook. If that worked for you, fantastic. And I expect it worked for most of you. Raise your hand if it worked. If it gave you an error, raise your hand. Okay, we're not going to worry too much about the error because we can uh, we can take a second approach. Are you uh, running in Windows or Mac OS? Yeah, it's not going to work. By the way, this is not going to work in Mac. Um, so for this project that you're working on, you're going to have to get to a Windows installation of, of Excel. Uh, okay. So now what I'm going to do is just, and this is one of the great things about the whole ODBC model, the open database connectivity model, is that here's our connection string. This has all the information that we need to connect on to the database in the cloud. So the, 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 the host name is colonialbakehouse.com. It takes a username and a password. There's a database that we're connecting to. This is the information we need to be able to connect on using the SQL Server driver. I'm gonna comment that out. And I'm going to enable this connection string, which is the, the ACE uh, database. This is the one that we use to connect to uh, an access database. So this is now assuming that we have the access database placed in the same location as the workbook. So what's the source? What's the data source for this database connection? Well, it's just looking at a database file locally on this machine. And so it's looking at the same path where this workbook is saved. And then we're looking for that the uh, database we downloaded work log.accdb. I'm gonna go ahead and delete sheet two, one that we just brought the data in for. So I've got just this blank sheet here. And now that I've enabled the connection string for access, I'm gonna run the code again. And it's brought that data in again, but this time it's brought in from the access database. And so that's a really great thing to be able to say, listen, I've got this, this code that will work for any database that, we're, that we can connect to, 
The only difference is talking, you know, telling it how to get connected onto that database. And then the rest of it works exactly the same to put the data in or to pull the data out and so forth. Any questions here? So this, what you're doing here with this connection now with access, this is the kind of connection that you're going to need to make to the data for the project. Again, the project gives you an access database to be able to put data into. And so this is now given us, given us an example of working with a local access database instead of working with a Microsoft SQL Server database in the cloud. Okay, so uh, again, review from last week. So now let's just kind of come up to Let's come up to uh, record edit. Now, ultimately what we're going to do, you remember working with user forms, how we could say, we want some code to respond to when an object receives an event. So when this button gets the click, run some code. When this user form gets initialized, run some code. Well, user forms is not the only place you can do that. We can also do that on worksheets. We can do it on a workbook. You can say, when this workbook opens, run some code. What we're going to say is on this worksheet, anytime a cell, a cell value changes, we want to run some code. That's where we're headed with it. But before we actually set up that event trigger, we want to get the code debugged and get it working when we run it automatically. And then we're going to say, all right, now go ahead and um, go ahead and make this run every time the user edits a cell, because that's what we're trying to say. Every time they edit a cell, we want to run the code to to log with change they made. So far, so good? Okay, so that's the reason that this is set up a little bit strange because ultimately we want this to record the edit and I'm gonna pass into it what sheet the user was working on when they made the change and what's, what, what cell, I'm calling it target here, what cell they're editing. Because this sub procedure takes arguments, a sheet and a cell, I can't just run it. Instead, I've got uh, another procedure up here that's just for debugging that's going to call record edit. It's going to call this procedure and it's going to say, ah, oh, we're going to pass it in whatever sheet is active. And then the active cell is what we're, what we're looking for. So now to run this, I will run my Acme sub runner and that will then run this passing it in the objects that it needs to be able to actually execute. Show me on a scale of zero to five how comfortable you are with this idea um, of having a procedure that's here just to be able to run another one that takes arguments. Three, four, five, 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 fours and fives. Okay. Yeah, question, go ahead. Why would you do that? Why? Yeah, why would you set it up that way? Oh, oh yeah. So the reason that, that it's set up this way is because when we get to the part where we're saying we want this code to automatically execute. We're not gonna know which sheet the user's on. We're not gonna know which cell the user's on, but the event handler, when, when it, the event handler goes, oh, someone just changed the cell, it's gonna know here's the sheet and here's the cell that they were on. And so we'll use that information to pass forward to here. And then regardless of the sheet and cell that they're on, we'll be able to record the right information, okay? Other questions? Okay, so let's just go through the code that we have so far. Now, I'm gonna scroll down here. The two objects that we use when we're reading data, we needed a connection object and a record set object. The connection gets us connected to the database. The record set object handles a set of records that's coming back. When we're inserting data into the database or updating or deleting data, we don't need a record set because we're not bringing back a set of records. So the only object we're gonna need here is a connection. So we've got our connection object ready to be configured and we are going to use the same connection string that we used below. And you could switch this between uh, the SQL Server connection or your access connection at your choice. We're gonna open the connection. So here's the connection object CN. We're gonna call the open method of that connection object. We're gonna give it the connection string and that's gonna open up the connection. And then we're ready to manipulate it. Now here I'm configuring the, uh, an insert statement. So when we're reading records back, we're gonna use a select statement, select star from applicant. Okay, great, we're pulling data out. 
it's a different command, a different structured query language command to put data in. This is called the insert state. Um, the way this one works, well, instead of looking at it, oh, this isn't too bad to look at. So we're going to insert into some table. The table is called work log. Like we can kind of go back to our query. Right, so here's where we're selecting the records out from work log. So that'll bring those records. Apparently some people have actually executed this so far. Good for you. So we're going to insert a record into work log and we're going to tell it the columns that we want to supply values to. So we're saying we're going to supply one, two, three, four, five, six, right, one, two, three, four, five, six, six values. We're going to give it a username, a workbook, a sheet, an address, a formula, and a cell. And then in the values clause, and we use single quotes to identify sh um, string literals in SQL, we're going to say our username is kworthen. This is the database, or this is the, uh, the workbook they're working on. This is the sheet he's working on. This is the cell. This is the formula. And this is the value that it's producing. So they're going to line up one for one. Username is here. Workbook is whatever value I'm putting here. Sheet. And so when this statement makes it to the database, and we don't have the code to put it to the database yet, but when this statement gets to the database, then it's going to accept that record as long as it meets all the restrictions, right? It's got to make sure that um, you've got all the data you need. It's the right uh, type and so forth. Go ahead. So That's right. So right, you're talking about this right here? Yeah. Yeah, it's actually called the column name in the database. Yeah, in fact, if we look at the, if we look over here, we'll see those same things. Username, workbook, sheet, address, right? Username, workbook, sheet, address. So those are the columns we're putting the data into. Now, we're not giving it an event ID or an event time, and that's because the database does those automatically. So when you put the data in here, it's going to record the time. It's going to record, you know, what event number it is. But all we're doing right now is we're opening a connection, we're setting a, a string variable, we're printing out that variable, and then we're closing the connection. So we're not actually trying to change the database yet. That's going to be the, the, the context for today's example. But what I do want to do is run this, and maybe instead of a K word, then I'll put my own in here. And I'll run that. Uh, now, of course, when I try to run that, it tells me, hey, you can't run this because you've got to give me arguments to this one, which is why I try to name my function to actually run this function with something that's alphabetically smaller than anything else so that I can just click run without having to click which one I want to run. Now, the whole point to this point is just to get that insert statement. Feel free to do this along with me or not do it along with me. Either one is fine. But I'm going to come in here and paste in that statement. I will separate these statements with a semicolon. So if I run this, it'll first do the insert, then it'll select this information back. But the point is now that I should be able to see that I have executed that, that statement just here through the web interface, and it's put that record in, right? So 335, user Allen, G Allen 2, and then the rest of these have come in. And it looks like several of you have been successful uh, at doing this. Uh, including some of you have been successful using my name here, which is okay. All right. In fact, one of those might have been me. I don't know. Okay. How are we doing so far? Any questions? Yes, go ahead. So if you only wanted to, I don't know why you do this in this instance, but if you only wanted to enter information into three of the columns, you could just specify those three columns. Yeah, that is exactly right. Because here there are, what do we say, five, six, seven, eight, there's eight columns in this database. We're supplying values for six of them. And we could certainly narrow that down. Now, one of the things that database management systems do is they say, listen, there's, there's some rules. If you're going to put a record in here, you know, it might say username is not allowed to be blank. I haven't put that constraint on this data, but that would be a common thing. And if you, if you tried to do that without supplying a username, it would give you back an error and say, sorry, you, you left the username blank. There's got to be a value for it. So assuming that it still meets all the constraints, you certainly could do that. Question here. Could you just put null no, or? or could you put null? No, we're going to talk about null no today. The answer is yes, but we'll talk about that today. It's an important thing to learn. Okay. So now let's just see if we can get this to go in. 
um, directly. Okay, so I am going to maybe right after, oh no, I left the, I didn't think I had the execute on. Uh, we, we were actually, rain this will execute uh, that because I had forgotten, I didn't, I didn't intend to leave this statement in. But this is a statement that says using the connection, the very connection that we opened, we are going to execute that structured query language statement that we identified here. So, uh, so running this actually does put the record right into the database. We see that now? It was actually on this example, I meant to take this out. That's okay. So our real work is now, so, so we've got this now executing um, a statement that will put data into the database. Now our task is we've got to get this to actually say the right data, right? And this is going to be a big part of what you're doing in the project is you're saying, listen, on this Excel workbook, I, I might have dozens of pieces of data that I have to read off and insert into the database. So we've got ourselves kind of a, a query hard coded here, but how are we going to make that into a query that's showing the appropriate data? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of, I'm going to parameterize this query. Now it turns out that for most relational database management systems, they, they really can be a query that you set up and you tell it, hey, this is a parameterized query and I'm going to send values into it. I'm not going that far. When I say a parameterized query, I'm looking at the string. I am going to build a string and send that string off to the database to be uh, made it by, to, to be inserted. As far as the database knows, there's never ever a parameter created because it's just gonna insert this insert statement. But to help me get along the way, I'm gonna say, listen, instead of having the, the name hard-coded right here, I'm gonna put a tag in for myself. And I, this is now completely arbitrary. I could do whatever I want, but I'm gonna put it inside of angle brackets and I'm gonna call it username. Now, after I've set up that query, I'm going to say SQL is going to equal something else. What is it going to equal? The results of the replace function. I'm going to start, I'm going to send into the replace function SQL. I'm going to look for username in brackets or in these angle brackets. And I'm going to replace it with uh, a username. In fact, let's just go ahead and go all the way. I'm going to do application dot username. And that will read uh, my username from whatever account I'm logged into Excel with. And so I'm going to take that expression and put that as the replace value. So now when I run that, uh, here's the insert, give me the insert statement right here. You can see that it has built that into my insert statement. So if I come back here and execute the results, oops, I did another insert, I don't want the insert there anymore. Then we should be able to see that. Now, whoever did this, you, you left it inside quotes. And so instead of actually telling it to read, you said go to the application object and pull in the username, it said, oh, you really want to put in application.username. It took it as a string literal. So go, go rid of, get rid of the quotes around it. Yep. So in the, in the SQL variable, why does this replace the SQL quote with application? Ah, so why not just put it here? Is what you're saying? Yeah, without the, without the SQL quote. Ah, okay. Without, without these quotes? Now, those quotes have to be there because that quote has to end up in the statement that we're sending in. That quote has to be there. Here's the reason that I don't do it, what you're suggesting. It's a reasonable thing to do. What you said was, stop that string and concatenate the value in right here. This will do exactly the same thing. The reason I'm not doing this to you is because this is gonna get ugly because I've got here a double quote right next to a single quote and it's gonna get really hard to follow. And so what I wanna do here is I wanna leave this as simple as possible. And then I'll have other lines that kind of come and do, and do the modification. 
but you're absolutely right. That approach would work. And it's, and it's a much more common approach that you'll see in examples. If you go to the examples to people doing this, that's exactly how they'll do it. And the code is really difficult to read. Okay, well, let's just go ahead and change the rest of these. Let's put some more in here. So this is gonna be the name of the, of the workbook. So I'll just call this workbook, woke book, <laughs> whoops, W-O-R-K. You get my political leanings, I guess now. Woke book, workbook. And I'll do the same thing down here. We're gonna replace workbook with what? This workbook dot name. Hmm. All right, the rest of these are a little bit, we actually have to get into what's being passed in to these to work. But I'm gonna run this one, make sure this works okay. So I've got Gov Allen and yeah, there's the name of the workbook that I'm working on. Before I take that question, I just have to point out that at, at other universities that I've taught at, I would be very uncomfortable um, showing the results of stuff that just anyone could have put in here uh, to display before the class. Uh, but at BYU, I have no such concerns. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so the question is, hey, how come it's in, in all caps? And the answer is one place that VBA does care about caps is when we're doing string comparisons. So if I ask if two strings are equal to each other, if the case is different, the answer is no. And so here, I, I want this to kind of stand out to me is why I put it in all caps is because I want to be able to look at that and, and kind of visually go, ah, that's a tag that I'm going to have to replace. But whatever I put here is totally arbitrary. Um, as, as long, what I want to be careful is that the risk in doing what we're doing here is suppose that I just, let's suppose for sheet one, I'm going to go ahead and put this one in as worksheet inside of brackets or inside of angle brackets. But let's just, let's suppose that instead of doing that, I had just put in sh um, control Z. I had just put in sheet. <clears throat> if either the username or the workbook actually has the characters S H E E T in it, and I came over here to replace that, right? If I'm trying to replace sheet. If my workbook name has the word sheet in it and I just replace sheet, it's gonna, it's actually gonna replace it in the value that I plugged into it here. You see what I'm saying? Once I, once I replace this with the text, whatever text is there is now potentially ready for me to, to replace the next time I get here. So what I use here for my, um, my tags, I want it to be stuff that I'm pretty sure is not gonna show up in the actual data that's getting replaced before we get here. Otherwise we could inadvertently um, change something separate. We could, we, could change, we could change something that we'd put in in a prior replace statement. It was probably not the best explanation I've ever given on that. How are you feeling with this idea of inadvertently replacing some data that was put in by a prior replace statement? Oh, okay, looks like you got it even, even though my ineptitude kind of, I felt pretty, pretty inept about that. Okay, good. All right, now the sheet name, whew, where are we gonna get the sheet name? Well, SH is the worksheet object that's getting passed in here, right? I'm passing in the active sheet. So I should be able to use that variable to read what the sheet name is. Just sh.name. So this is gonna be my address. And what's the name of the, of the range I'm setting in? It's called target. So we'll have a similar one here for address. And 
and that will be target.address. Then this one's going to be formula. And I'll do value while I'm at it. for the formula and the value. Now, it seems like on my active cell, I better put something over here for me to actually have. So I'll come over here. Maybe I'll just do it here on sheet three. And here I'm going to put the sum of then A2 to A35. So I'll make sure that that's my active cell because right now the code is saying, we're gonna record that information about the active cell. So in my active cell, I put a formula, it has a value and I should be able to get all that information. It's on a sheet called sheet three, that's fine. So now I should be able to run this. And if I've done all of this right, that should produce a good SQL statement that will get executed over there. I'm gonna clear up my immediate window because here is where Here's where I'm likely to have problems. I've made a lot of changes here. I'm gonna execute that and, and if it fails, and as I should say, when you're working on your project, when it fails, because there'll be several times you're kind of working through data, things that are unexpected will kind of show up and you'll have to make adjustments in your code. It's really nice to have the debug.print SQL just before you go to execute it. So when it fails, you can actually see what was it I was trying to execute because you're building all this dynamically. Looks like it didn't fail, but here then it's nice. I do see the statement that I'm executing. And I'll go check to see what that brought in. Did it bring it in? Yeah, so it brought in, it brought in the formula and it brought in the value. So if, if, you're, if you are Drew, hey Drew, you were on a cell that was completely empty when you ran it. No formula, no value. Uh, Keegan, you are on applicant ID. Formula and the value are the same. Questions? Now, as I look at the addresses that this is producing, and this is just the way that the address property does, it's got these dollar signs in it. They're always there. I don't really want to see those dollar signs. So what could I do? What can I do to get rid of those dollar signs? Yeah, I could just use the replace function right around this part right here. So I'm gonna sneak that right in here. Like maybe I'll, I'm gonna, uh, I'll just do the replace. I'm gonna replace, looking at target.address, and I'm gonna, Usually I like to put in the syntax first before I think about it. Otherwise I forget putting a comma or a semicolon or a, a closing parenthesis. I wanna look for the dollar sign and I wanna replace it with an empty string. So quote, quote. So now what am I gonna replace the address tag with? Well, whatever the target's address is, but we're gonna call the replace function to take out any dollar signs there first. So if I run that, I should now get, there we go. We now have addresses coming in without the dollar signs. And several of you have been successful with that. All right, let me do this. I'm gonna come back and put a different formula in here. Um, and let's say, this will be kind of an interesting one. I'm gonna say this is going to be um, I'm gonna write some text here. So this is gonna be the name of this 
person. And then I want to put an apostrophe S on the end of it. So I'll concatenate on quote, and then a single quote, S, close quote. I'll put a space after that as well. So we'll do Mariano's space, concatenate on to that um, a number. Mariano's, oh, actually, Mariano's, I'll put the number here, N U M B E R, colon. And then I will concatenate onto that actually Mariano's telephone number. So that's the value that I'm going to expect to see for that particular cell. I think I want to space after the colon, not that it's that critical. But so now this is, says, you know, Mariano's telephone number. I would like to insert that into my database. So I'm gonna come back here and run this again, but let me go ahead and clear off my immediate window. I'll run it. And this time I've got an error, incorrect syntax near apostrophe S, or actually near S, what it says in quotes. So if I hit debug, it's just gonna tell me, it's right here when you tried to execute it. So there, it's saying there's something about my query that it doesn't like. Let me go ahead and bring this line down onto the next line. So here's my insert statement. Ooh, it's kind of long. Insert into work log, all these different columns, that's fine. We're gonna put these values in. Now, let's think about how uh, Microsoft SQL Server is gonna interpret this. Just like VBA, it has to look at this and figure out what to do with it, right? There's a different interpreter that's gonna be running this. It's, the, it's the, the SQL Server query interpreter that's working with it. It gets to here, insert, and it goes, got it, insert. This is the insert statement, We're putting data in the database. It goes into, all right, I'm getting ready for the table you're gonna tell me. It gets to work log and it goes, work log. Is that a valid table? Looks in the list, goes, yep, that's a valid table. And then you're giving it all these values and it's checking to make sure all those are column names in the table work log. So far, so good. It's getting past all that stuff. It gets here to the word values and it goes, oh, okay, I get it. Coming up is the values I'm gonna put into those columns, figuring this stuff out as we go. Uh, opening parenthesis, okay, it's the beginning of the list and it says, ah, quote, a bunch of characters, quote, that's the first value. It says, I'm not actually putting those quotes in there. The quotes just say, this is a string literal. So it goes start of the string, a bunch of characters, end of the string. Great, that's what goes into the first value. Same thing happens here. Bunch of characters goes into the second column. Same thing here, a bunch of characters goes to the second column. Same thing here, uh, open quote, character, character, close quote, end of the string, just expect what we're expecting, comma, we're getting to the next one. Uh, and now we're getting to this one, open quote, bunch of characters, super. Equals B3 space, these are all characters going in and it gets to, uh, so this is still part of the formula. So the formula has a double quote there and it gets to that single quote and what does it do? It goes end of the string. I started with a quote and I got to that quote. That's the end of the string. And then it gets to that right there. What is it expecting here? What should be the next character? Comma. It doesn't see a comma. What does it get? An S. And so that's why it said incorrect syntax near S. Um, I'm lost in space. And Oh, here it is. Incorrect syntax near S is because it got there and it got confused. It understood everything up to right there. Ooh. So dealing with that single quote that can show up in my data is gonna be a problem. What are we gonna do? I don't think I've shown you this yet in VBA, but let me show you how we handle that situation in VBA. Let's suppose that I wanted to print out something like say, um, he said, he, and then in quotes, likes it. Because, you know, it's like sarcastic or something. You see how I have the same problem here? VBA interpreter is going to come along and say, quote, okay, string literal. There's the end of the string literal. And it's going to get that L. It's going to not understand what's going on. Um, actually, oh, that was unexpected. Let's try to put that into a variable and then see if we can print it. Let me uh, go put this in code. I think, that's the, I think that's the print statement, being able to take things a little more complex than, than normal. Don't do this along with me, just watch this.
Okay, so yeah, it, it goes red there because it gets confused by this light. What are you trying to do with this? So how do I tell it? No, 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 no. This is not the end of the string. This is just a quote character in the string. Any thoughts? Ah, in some languages, you could say, oh, you know what? Just come out here and do single quotes out here. Like JavaScript will let you do this. Python will let you do this. And then it would go, oh, this string is delimited by single quotes, so the double quotes are okay in it. But what's the single quote character mean in VBA? That's a comment. Every single person who took the test got that question right. Um, that's good. I know you knew that. So we have to use the only delimiter we can use to do string literals in VBA is double quote. So single quote doesn't do it for us. It's weird. Here's what you do. Instead of putting in a double quote, you put in two double quotes. Quote, quote. And here's, and here's what happens. You do <coughs> debug.print of X. It says, all right, quote, beginning of the string, super, H-E-S-A-I-D, all in the string. It gets to that quote and it goes, I think that's the end of the string, but wait a minute. Let me peek ahead and see if the very next character is a quote. And if it is, then I go, oh, that's not the end of the quote. That's not the end of the string. That's actually just a quote inside the string. So there's a quote, L-I-K-E-S. Oh, here's the end of the string. Oh, wait a minute, let me check, let me peek. Oh, nope, it's not really the end of the string. It's just a quote inside the string. And it gets to here and it gets to that quote and goes, let me, that's the end of the string. Oh, wait, let me check. And it says, oh yeah, there's nothing else after that. That's the end of the string. So when I run this, uh, that's when I run this. Yeah, so then it actually puts those quotes as a part of the string literal. That seems strange to me that you just put two of them in a row, but it's a common thing that they did in programming back in the day. Uh, and when, when is basic invented in the 1970s. And so this is the way you do it in basic. And they just kind of brought the convention along when they made visual basic. Structured query language, exactly the same thing. So if I were to take that, let me go ahead and run this again. I think I'm going to run this again. Oh, wrong one. What I really have to do for this. Uh, oh, actually, I have to get to the right sheet. I ran the wrong thing and it put a new sheet in for me. Got to be on this one. Run the code. Fine. Bring the values down so we can see them. What I really have to do is I've got to turn that into two single quotes in a row, and then it will take it just fine. So how are we going to do it? Yep. Yeah, we'll do the same replace. Now this one, because I know that we're going to do something a little more complex with the formula, rather than just do it in line, like we did it here, I'm going to set up a separate variable for it because there's a couple more there's a couple more things I'm going to want to do with formula in particular as we're building this out. So I'm going to come up to my dim section. I'm going to dim formula as string. So I've made a string variable called formula, and then I think I'm going to I'm going to bring formula to the end. We're doing some, we're gonna do a little bit, a little more with it. And I'm gonna say formula equals target.formula. So we're reading the formula out of the cell. In fact, maybe I'll just do the replace right here. SQL, sorry, replace, formula equals replace. Look at target.formula, look for, just putting the quotes in for now and we'll go back and fix it in a minute. So I'm gonna look, for, and this is gonna look terrible. I'm gonna look for single quote inside of two double quotes and replace it with two single quotes. Is that hard to read at all? Here's another option. So it turns out every single one of our characters has a number that's actually stored as. So if I was to look for character number 65, we'd go, oh, that's capital A. Uh, capital uh, B is character number 66. So there's actually a numeric representation for each character. 
uh, character number 30, is it 34 or 39? 34 is a double quote. I think 39 is a single quote. Yeah. So that's another way to say single quote. So I could, another way to do it would be to say, look for character 39, single quote, and replace it with character 39 concatenated with character 39. Two single quotes. Which way do you like it better? Character number 39 or kind of quotes inside of quotes? Who says character 39? Who says quotes inside of quotes? Oh, a few of each. Excellent. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and put the formula in here. So now I'm setting up my formula to be, to look at what's in there. And if there's a, oh, formula isn't, yeah, I, I want it for formula, but I need it for value as well, because it's going to show up in the value too, isn't it? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do the, there's not much I'm going to do with the value. So I'm going to go ahead and do the value in line. So I'll come around value and replace it with the same thing. Oops. Need one more parenthesis on the end. You'll see why I'm treating formula separately here because there's one, there's one more thing I'm gonna wanna do with the formula variable as we're working with it. All right, I, I, <clears throat> if I um, am correct here, I think we're in good shape to run now. We should be able to run this. It runs without error. I should be able to see that value. Yeah, so the formula has a single quote showing in there and it says Mariano's number. Okay. Zero to five, how are we doing so far? Just show me. Five, 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 three, five, five. Okay, thank you. Now here's what I'd like to do. You'll notice that when we don't have a formula in the cell, what does the formula property give me back? If there's no formula there, I kind of wish there was no formula, it would be null, but it's not. If I ask for the formula and there's no formula, what did it give me? It just gives me the value that's in the cell which I guess in a sense, that's the formula because it's just what you typed in there. Okay, so it's reasonable. That's the way they chose to do it. But I'm saying, no, 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 no. If there's no formula, I want the formula to be empty. So I really wanna, I wanna be able to look at this and say, huh, the formula matches the value. And so uh, I'm not gonna put the formula in. I'm instead gonna say, leave this cell blank. You ready for this one? This one's a little bit, a little bit more complicated. There's a few, a few more moving parts here. <clears throat> okay. So in the case when I want to not show a formula, it's when the formula equals the value. So I'm gonna come here and put an if statement. If my targets, this is before I've changed. Well, I'm never changing the target formula. I'm just gonna say if the target formula, remember target, is the parameter that's getting passed in here for the range. It's called target. It's the target cell that's being changed. If the target formula is equal to the target's value, then I wanna do something else. I wanna set formula to that. If the two are the same, And I'll show you what I want to do. I'm going to copy my last statement that worked well. And I'm going to come and actually I'm going to open up another one of these windows. I'm going to put this insert statement in, zoom in a bit, I guess. So what I'm going to do is for the, in this case, I really don't want to put the formula in at all. I do want the value to show up. Oh. So yeah, let me simplify this. Let's just say, instead of it actually being a formula, it's just you know, a value of say 100 or 1000. 
Okay, and so here, what I really want to have here is null, N-U-L-L. So null is a reserved word in structured query language that says no value. It's different than a zero length string. Quote, quote would be a zero length string. If I think about in memory, we learned about VBA, how much memory is allocated for a zero length string? I know this is something you might've thought about for the exam, but haven't thought about since. What is it? Okay, it, it actually depends on the variable type. It's a string variable. So it's a string variable. Uh, and there's, there's four bytes of overhead for every string. And so a zero length string takes four bytes to be able to record. Null is the absence of any value altogether. And so even though a zero length string looks a lot like no value, it really is something. Kind of the same thing in the world of database too. So um, could I put in here, quote, quote? Yeah, it would take it. But that's a zero length string. It's not the absence of a value. So we really want this to say null, N-U-L-L. -L. So I should be able to run this and then run this. And we should see, yeah, so there's no value here. In fact, I can select, now I can select where formula is null. And these are the ones that, where there is no value in the formula. Huh. You can see here's the ones where I was practicing this example last week. Okay. So what shall I put here? If the target equals the formula, what should I do? Down here, if they're not equal to each other, I'm gonna say the formula is gonna be, let's just go ahead and replace, make sure we don't have any single quotes in the formula. Ultimately, whatever I put in here is gonna go to replace my formula tag with. So what should I put? Uh, formula equals, now here's a problem. It turns out null is also a reserved word in VBA. And in VBA means the same thing, the absence of a value. Am I allowed to do this? Can I put null into a string? I think I can. This one, this, the, the, the SQL this generates definitely will not execute. Let me just see if that is even syntactically valid. Yeah, it takes it just fine. Now we're gonna look up here at the query that I created. Oh, it's because we don't even go through this part. I gotta get onto a cell that, that would execute that. I come over here to just uh, a value that's gonna match. Okay, invalid use of null. So it's saying, listen, null is the absence of a value and you can't put that into a string variable. Places you can put it, but you can't put it into a string variable. You want no value here, use zero length string. But what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to get four characters there. I'm trying to get the characters N-U-L-L -L, so that those characters will end up in the structured query language, right? So when I replace the formula tag in my SQL or my structured query language statement, with whatever's in the formula variable, it says N-U-L-L. -L. So what do I have to do? Yeah, this has to be in quotes. Because now it's not the VBA reserved word null, it is the string N-U-L-L -L, and VBA says, that's fine. Can I put N-U-L-L -L into a string? Sure, All right, give me a string. So I'll go ahead and run this. It runs through, let's see what it did. Get rid of my where clause. and it actually put the word N-U-L-L -L into the database. Ah. Well, let's look at the statement and see if we can see why it did. Uh, SQL for their statements uh, are not case sensitive. In many database management systems, even string comparisons are not case sensitive by default. And that's the case with SQL Server uh, and Access as well. Okay, so what have I done here? You see the problem? Yeah, I actually have quotes going around the word null. Oh boy. And that's because what I'm replacing is 
quote formula, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, angle bracket formula. The quotes, I'm never touching the quotes. I've got a couple of options here. One, I could say, well, let's not have the quotes up there at all. And then if we come through this way, let's put some quotes on it. Does that make sense? If I didn't have the quote here, then when I put the value in there, I could put the quote here. Quote concatenated with this. That's one approach. I don't really like that approach. Well, I think what I'd rather do is because this will help me with every single, if I have more than one field that I have to deal with the null question on, I think what I'd like to do is after I've got the query all ready to run, let me just look if I see quote null quote in my query and then replace it with what? Yeah, just null without the quote around it. And so I think I'm gonna do that again, just before I execute. I'm gonna say, let's look for single quote N-U-L-L. -L. It's gonna to have to match case. Um, SQL would have been fine with it in uppercase, lowercase, mixed case like I have it here. And I'll replace it with N-U-L-L -L as a string, but without the single quotes around it. So the, I know it's hard to see, but let me just go ahead and highlight one of those single quotes so you can see it. So it's there on this one. It's missing on the second one. So I'm looking for quote null quote and replacing it just with null. I prefer this approach just because this one statement now will take care of any, any strings that I've made into null here. <sighs> I'm almost ready to take your question. Let me run that, make sure it works. And submit this. And now we've got them going in without null. Go ahead. Up here? Yeah. Ah, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying, all right, so my formula variable is gonna equal N-U-L-L, -L, and then I'm going to replace this with N-U-L-L. -L. If I look at it up here, that's what I've just replaced. So the single quotes are untouched. And so, and so that will say quote N-U-L-L -L quote in it, and that's why I'm gonna come in and make the change here. There's several other approaches that I could have taken. That's, this is the one that I'm, that I'm using. Questions? Oh, one last thing that we have to do in one minute. I'd like to make this actually, actually do the logging. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna come to this workbook. Let's see, what's the name of my in record edit? I'm gonna come to this workbook and same thing here. I'm gonna choose from my drop-down list here, I'm gonna choose the work book. <coughs> and then the event that I'm gonna choose is called sheet change. And then here I'm just gonna say, hmm, I only wanna record single cell edits. So I'm gonna say if, you can see it's passing in the worksheet and the target here. If target dot cells dot count, is equal to one, it's only one cell, then I wanna record it. So I'm gonna record edit, I'm gonna pass it SH and target. So the same things that are getting passed in here, I'm just gonna pass along to my record edit. That should do the trick. This should now be logging every change that I make up to the database. So all of those are going in. Okay, folks, that's it for today. I'll leave the screen here in case you wanna kind of get that one caught up and we'll call it good. Thanks for coming.